No. You can't. Oh, Bella! Right. Uh, this is our first meeting in some time because of all sorts of reasons which I... It's a second meeting. <laughs> it's your first meeting. It's your first meeting. Right. 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 However, uh, we hope that uh, we'll be able to get going now. Uh, the next the ne lecture at the next meeting is here already to spy out the land and see how we go. Uh, right. So, uh, Something about quickly about our speaker who is probably familiar to the Guardian be familiar to quite a few people here. But uh, just in case, uh, from memory, because I lost my notes, from memory, uh, she was born in Bradford, Yorkshire. Not Bradford in Yorkshire. Uh, mind you, it, it probably isn't anymore because of the Islamic invasion then. But, um, all right, uh, she went up to Oxford to do a PPE, that's Politics, Philosophy, Economics course at St. Hilda's. And after that, she uh, met her husband, uh, whom, uh, whom she eventually accompanied, they, they, they made a year, but before that, no, 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 it was right before that. <laughs> after that, after that, after that, she was working at Hadassah uh, Medical Organization and um, various other things uh, she had to do. And then, uh, and they had a family. And then, about 30 years after they were married in Nishtogada, Alex went in to have what's supposed to be a routine operation which she never came out of. <coughs> um, since then, Donia has um, been involved in, what would you say, adult education through Hadassah, like something of the sort. Uh, and has received, uh, I think she received an award for that. I, my second career, <laughs> because PPE doesn't equip you for all that much, so I did a, um, a, a Master of Public Health degree in Hadassah, and afterwards I worked in Hadassah for 20 years um, with a project uh, for the retired personnel that I established and coordinated. That's enough, right? No, well, that's enough. <laughs> Uh, among other things, um, Donia has published the memoirs of her late husband, diary, diary of her late husband, the years of the German occupation, how he and his, of Holland, oh, I'm sorry, of course he was Dutch, and uh, the, uh, how they managed to survive, I've read the book myself, it's very fascinating, and um, it brings home to you what we in Britain, uh, we're fortunate to miss, uh, although I must say as an uh, aside, uh, I grew up as a schoolboy uh, under the Nazi blitz when the Luftwaffe raided Merseyside 30 days of succession. And to me, it was just part of living. We, you know, as a child, you don't take your th your things in the way adults do. Anyway, uh, these days, Donia is a volunteer at the uh, Israel Museum, is it, or the Bible, the Bible Lands Museum? I, I stopped with the COVID. Oh, you did? Okay. Oh, let me see. Uh, that's enough. Okay, that's enough. So, after the introduction, I want to say something later on about uh, uh, former members of the committee, but uh, let's get on with the lecture. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I'm going to talk about the diaries of Rabbi Chaim Yosef David Azulai, who is known as the Kida, and he's also a street in Bayt Vagan, where I lived all the time I lived in, uh, in Israel, I lived in Bayt Vagan, I'm still living in Bayt Vagan, in Nofei Yerushalayim at the moment. Uh, okay, the diaries, I understand, um, 
were unknown to people. They were written in Hebrew and translated, a wonderful translation um, with an annotation by Dr. Benjamin Zimmerman. And I would like to know if anybody knows him. Knew him? Good. <laughs> also, um, he was a science teacher, but clearly a Torah scholar. Um, and the diaries of, of the Chida uh, were written in the 18th century, and they record the Chida's extensive travels as an emissary from Eretz Yisrael during the period 1753 to 1788. And the diaries cover two periods, and in between, there's a period when he doesn't write, um, that's the period when he was presumably with his family in Eretz Israel, and for about five years he also served as a rabbi of Cairo. Each of, uh, of his two missions as an emissary meant that he spent years away from his family. His last years were spent in Livorno. The last diary entry after claiming of ill health was in 1794, and he died in 1806 at the age of 82. He was born in Jerusalem in 1724 and studied in the yeshiva of the great rabbi Chaim ben Atar, known as the Or HaKharim. Before the age of 30, the Chida was already recognized as one of the leading Torah scholars of his time. He lived for some years in Hebron, studying and writing and was the author of about 100 works. He apparently had a broad intellect, encompassing much of the scientific knowledge of his time, history, and speaking at least six languages. The purpose of his journeys abroad was both to bring Jewish scholarship from the Holy Land to the scattered <coughs> Jewish communities in the Gola, and to collect funds to take back to support the yeshivot in the four holy cities, Jerusalem, Safed, Hebron, and Tiberias. Travel was dangerous in those days, especially as the emissaries carried on their persons the funds that they collected from the Jewish communities that they visited. Leaving the Holy Land was in itself a long and dangerous operation, as the Chida describes it in his diary. In 1753, at the age of 29, he left Jerusalem for Hebron, from where he set out in rainy weather for Gaza, accompanied by two friends. After an arduous journey, they reached Gaza, where there was a Jewish community at that time, and they stayed there over Shabbat Sachor. In Gaza, he joined a large group of 70 travelers that included Gentiles, under the protection of a Sheikh Salim, who was their escort. Following the Sultan's Highway, the normal caravan route to Egypt, um, <clears throat> their destination was Alexandria, from where the Chida would sail for Europe. And I'm going to read you what he wrote, or at least something of what he wrote, um, about that journey before he'd even left, the, uh, left for Europe. Uh, <clears throat> the night after the Sabbath, <clears throat> we set forth, and the same day we arrived, uh, encamped in a place called Deir el-Balach, Balach, to allow Deir el-Balach. And there came a sheikh who molested us and also demanded Jaffa protection money, but our Sheikh Salim smote him by the sharpness of the sword until he was humbled, but, but among the living and the wounded how much pain there was, and the name, Hashem, may it be praised, in his mercy did not deliver us as prey for their teeth. Accompanying us were many Gentiles, some seventy souls, and on the day of Purim, the Gentiles among us said, we should resume our journey on the Sabbath. 
and that the Jews would have to do so as well. And no spirit was left in me, and I said to myself, was it for this that I had to wait in Gaza in vain, to profane the Sabbath? And I fell at the feet of Sheikh Salem with tears and beseeching, and Hashem, may be praised, gave me grace and favor. And on the eve of Wednesday, he set out with us, and the entire caravan left and forgot to swallow their pride to no avail. On Wednesday, Shushan Purim, there blew up a great and mighty wind, and the Hashem, and the Shem, Hashem may it be praised, gave us strength and saved us. In the small, and this is another day, in the small hours of Thursday night, Chacham Samuel ben Chaim, his soul now in Eden, got lost. He found himself in the pitch black night, alone, like a cactus in the wilderness, far from the caravan, not knowing which way to turn. He did not wander about, but stood shouting for about half an hour. In answer to his cries, the quick and the dead responded. And hearing the voices, he used the sound to guide his way home. During all this I slept, but awoke when he returned. On hearing the story, I was troubled and then relieved. Friday at Mincha time, we set to our Sabbath place on the face of the desert near Bir el Abd. On the Sabbath day, we suffered from the strength of the sun in his might. Towards Mincha time, it became known to us all that there were many fierce tribes ahead of us, and even Sheikh Salem was seized by trembling. And as for the rest of us, what could we say? Broken in heart and weak in spirit. On Sunday, the 19th of the month, we traveled all day and all through the night and mighty was the flight. On one occasion, there was before us a swollen river to ford, and I rode the sheikh's horse and passed through. And Chacham, what was his name? Uh, Samuel ben Chaim, uh, on top of a camel, which while crossing through the water, knelt and, <laughs> and sat down. And all the food in the water, but everything was saved. Okay. So you see, <laughs> you have a very difficult uh, journey and we, we complain about the long line that we have to wait in at uh, Ben Gurion. <laughs> it took him weeks just to get to Alexandria. Okay. And then there was a very difficult voyage which lasted several weeks during which there were storms, seasickness, and lack of food. And the passengers arrived in Livorno, a busy port where there was an important Jewish community. As was customary, passengers from the Middle East were required to spend 40 days of quarantine in the Lazaretto. Lazaretto, uh, where there were also lepers and people with diseases, and people who came off the ships had to be in quarantine in that uh, <coughs> To his delight, the Chida was immediately supplied there with plentiful baskets of food by the Chacham Kaniti, the respected Signor Tedesco, and what he calls the envoys of Eretz Yisrael, who were resident in Livorno, the gateway to Europe. The diary continues with detailed descriptions of the Chida's travels through the Jewish communities of Italy, Germany, Holland, and from Holland to England. I would like to read to you some extracts from the diary concerning his time in England, especially appropriate to this gathering. Uh, this is already um, 1774, by the time he gets to England. He says, The holy Sabbath night and day we Sabbathed on the packet boat, and it set off at the end of the day of the holy Sabbath. Uh, it was from um, the Hook of Holland to Harwich, which is 
the usual uh, sea crossing, crossing the North Sea. Uh, <clears throat> at evening, we reached the port of Harwich, the beginning of England, and the articles and those that came on the packet boat were all taken to the customs house. I took out some money in English silver. I'm trying to get to find a position where there won't be an echo. I'm trying various things. Um, um, and so they took the things to the customs house, and I took out some money in English silver coins to pay the customs men at the documents control. And I put the purse in the belt around my loins. Afterwards, I came to the house where the baggage was, and they opened my coffer and carefully went through it, and they searched extremely fine in all the clothes and between the folds of the turban with great patience. I think you saw the picture of him wearing a turban, right? Um, they took all the documents concerning the mission and took them to their chief, for there was already the smell and sound of war from France. And uh, Dr. Zimmerman writes that this was the Seven Years' War from 1735 uh, to 1763. <clears throat> Even the sailors were carefully searched and each man took off his shoe and hose so as to examine secret parts. On one, they found a Dutch gilder, and they cut it up and threw it away. And I, in my affliction, was very distressed and worried, for I had with me some 180 Dutch gilders in my pouch. Meanwhile, a customs man prodded about my clothing and heard the sound of money jingling and said something and laughed. I was nervous, but then I remembered the purse of English money in my belt. I took them out and threw them down in front of him. When he saw that it was English money, he was ashamed and returned it. Now I had with me a recommendation to the master of the post there, and it interceded well and they returned the documents and they did not see the gilders uh, which I had on me. Praises to the Lord, may he be blessed. How can I repay God all that he has bestowed upon me? And we stayed there for two days in a Gentile hostelry. Now we come to something not so nice. Um, Tuesday at midday, we departed from Harwich. We had just passed through the gate of the city to where the coach was waiting, and I needed to pass water. In modesty, I went up to a stone wall nearby, and because I was still visible to everyone, I walked on a little and saw a field and on its other side, a depression somewhat lower. It appeared to my eyes to be solid ground of the earth. So I climbed over the stone wall intervening and thrust one leg onto the ground. But my leg and my thigh sank into mud and excrement. It seems that place was a slopping place, gathering all the dirt and excrement of the place. And my one leg and thigh were submerged, as mentioned, and the other leg was swinging, and my hands grasping the wall, and I saw myself in great danger and <laughs> of, of drowning there, heaven forfend. And I began shouting in a desperate voice, and no one heard me until a Gentile woman living some way away heard my voice, and she too began to scream. And I, in my affliction, there was no strength left in me to stay hanging. And I was afraid that perhaps the wall would fall on me and there would be stoning and suffocation both at the same time, heaven forfend. And the God of my father was to my help. And through the merit of my fathers, my trouble was seen by the coachman and my attendant. And they drew near 
and they hauled and drew up Joseph, hung with cords of disgrace and trailing disgust. Most of my clothing, not as the quality of that is the quality of this, the con I don't know what he means by that, they were filthy and putrid and exhilarated in stench. But God in his mercies gave into the heart of one Gentile who had come along at the sound of the commotion to bring me into his house. And there was a well of water and I took off my clothes and washed myself and my clothes and removed the filth from them. I put a rug over my body and I got into the carriage with my soaking clothes beside me. I will praise the Lord with all my heart who has sorely afflicted me but has not given me to his in death. I am unworthy of all the kindnesses. Blessed is the God who saved. Wednesday, next day, in the evening, uh, towards sunset, we arrived in the great city, London. But I had to exert myself that eve, uh, the eve of Thursday, until I found a lodging place in the house of a Sephardi. <coughs> this is his name, Signor Aaron Hakohen. May God grant him life. And though the place was uncomfortable, I acquiesced, it being a clean lodging and with a privy. This had been the guest house of the previous emissaries. In the matter of the mission, wonder of wonders were done unto me, because the heads of the community in the city came to tell me uh, not to come into the city since I would not make anything. Very stingy. The em emissaries from Tzfat who had preceded me had already come twice and left with clean hands. I replied that there was an obligation thrown on me to go and no one would be free. And on the day that I go out into the camps, the Lord would do whatever in his eyes is good. But when I went to all the Gvirim, they had left the town to pasture in the gardens. And there is no man left tre treading in his town. So I took unto myself the quality of patience. And I said to myself, there is no healer like time. Hush, do not mention the matter of the mission until you acquire some friends. But to which, which side of the Quirim should I go? For the Quirim have hearts divided one from the others in their inner interests, and their inside is not as their exterior. I saw two scandal among the sages of the city. They are the ones who speak scorn and blasphemy, each man to his fellow burning up and consuming with the rod of their tongues. Each man his fellow swallowing alive and sufficient in the disgrace is the eyes of the dignitaries. Woe to the eyes that see this, the profanation of the Torah and those who study it. I searched among my documents of authorization and I saw one in the writing referring to one Chacham in London and no more. And straight away I inquired about that Chacham. Is he the Rav of the place or a Dayan? They told me he is not a great one in this place, this Chacham. I said to myself, if so, then I do not have with me letters of those more important and greater than he. I would be making jealousy and damages like <coughs> and half the damage again by this missive. So I put it away and the danger would be removed. And the Lord reckoned it for good because this Chacham, his reputation is bad and the Dayanim and the chief dignitaries dislike him and blessed his glorious name who did not forsake his kindness and gave me favor in the eyes of some friends and chief among them the perfect sage, his honor Isaac de Valley and Signor Pinchas Gomez Sierra. May God grant them life. And uh, these of course are the uh, Spanish Jews that came from Amsterdam. 
uh, with, the, with Cromwell a century before. Uh, <clears throat> And they all responded, saying, Behold, the matter of this mission requires the great Ma'amad, and it is the custom of this city to make such a Ma'amad at the beginning of the winter. And even his honor, the Rav Rabbi Masood Bonan, may God grant him life, has already had to wait several months until the time of the meeting, and we do not know what you can do about it. But if you are wise, hear this. Behold the queer Signor Joseph Salvador. He is one of the Paranisi. And he has gone to take the waters, um, spa, and behold, he has a refined intelligence. And what he decrees and says will so stand, for his might is strong. And if God will give you favor in his eyes, the man will not rest except when he has concluded the matter for good. And it came to pass that when he, uh, Senor Joseph Salvador returned, I went to him and I saw his mind had indeed been measured out by them with a large measure, pure without lies. So anyway, he said that he would arrange to call um, a meeting so that they could decide what they were going to give uh, to the emissary. And uh, they make a collection, and after the collection from the Yehidim had been concluded, there arrived a letter from the English ambassador in Constantinople to instruct Signor Francos about me. Now, if that letter had arrived earlier, it would have had a tremendous effect. But anyway, it gave me honor and glory in the eyes of the dignitaries. Praise and glory to him who lives for everlasting. Now, among the friends that I had made was the Khazan, Signor David Castro, for he possessed a hand and a good name, Yad Vashem. And his words produced fruit and fruits from the fruit, with the Gvirim. May the Lord remember it for his good. And uh, this, he, uh, this uh, David Castro decides that he should see some of the sights of, of London. And there in the city of London, he took me to a castle called the Tower. And there I saw lions and an eagle, 100 years old, and an Indian cat as large as a dog, and another cat, I suppose, presuming the moat, uh, you saw these animals. And I also saw an upstairs chamber, its length about 50 cubits or more, and made into many smaller rooms. And the dividing partitions are of guns. Well, you know all about that, the armory. And he describes that. He said, I also <coughs> saw there all the kings of England, the image of the likeness of their form out of iron, mounted on horses of iron. And it was as if um, uh, uh, you, they had inside them a spirit of life, most wonderful, and many suits of armor of all different kinds set up. And in one darkened room, there is a separating barrier of iron, and within they showed us the royal crown and the crown jewels, full of sparkle, flashing with light, glowing like the lightning, and the golden chalice with which they anoint the king, and similar precious vessels, and, <clears throat> and kingly treasures of gems and pearls. Behold, all these have mine eyes seen, peering out from the embrasures, sorrowful and joyful. If thus, if thus to those who transgress his word, then to the doers of his will, how much more so, Behold, days are coming of desire and of glory, of the saving of the house of Israel, and our eyes will see the breath of our nostrils, the Messiah of the Lord, lighting up and illuminating like the sun seventyfold, crowned with the crowns of crowns. Holy of holies is he to the Lord. May this be his will. And I preached in London, that's Shabbat, that's Sabbath.
Um, he left London after three months uh, for Dover uh, on Parashat Varim in Tammuz to make the crossing to Calais in France to continue his mission. After spending nearly three months in England, as I said, he did not return to England on his second mission. I think he'd had enough of them. Uh, had, he did return to France. Um, the adventures that the Hida records as he continues his travels throughout Europe and North Africa include his boat being overrun by pirates, a situation from which he manages to come through unscathed, although he loses money that he is not able to hide. So I will read you the encounter with the pirates, which was um, in 1756. Uh, he describes uh, as they, the boat, their voyage on the um, they sail on the Mediterranean, and he he says that they saw the two volcanoes Stromboli and Grand Crateri, and uh, on Shabbat they saw Kara Burun. Don't know what that is. Anybody know? I don't know. In the morning, I awoke with the burst. Raise your hand against your oppressors, and may your enemies be cut off. And close to noon, we were boarded by the Corsair, Corsair Francis. The captain went up to him and attempted to stop him. But then some 20 of his sailors boarded us. They took me by force and led me to their ship. And they searched me with all manner of searches and they kept me and my captain prisoner. And uh, Benjamin Zimmerman says they were probably from the Maltese Knights Templar of St. John, who were notorious pirates in the Mediterranean, and they particularly liked to capture um, Jews because Jews get redeemed, eventually. <laughs> So, um, anyway, he was in great danger. Um, and, and what does he think of? And I, for my many sins, had not yet fulfilled the obligatory two meals of the Sabbath day. I was also greatly distressed, for I had deposited with the captain a purse full of taleros, um, a, wide, a widely minted silver coin, um, which was used for trade with the Levant. Uh, <clears throat> and, I, uh, and besides this, I had in my possession some 500 gold ducats. And I remember that I had with me letters from London, including a letter of exchange. If heaven forfend they would see any sign of suspicion, they would hold on to their falsehood saying everything was English property. And I recited, and may it be pleasant, Psalm 90 and 91, 91 times, and I vowed many vows, and praise the Lord, may he be blessed. On Sunday, the 15th at noon, they allowed us to go back to our ship. But the predator stayed sitting in the room which are the opening words of Psalm 91. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, and um, they sat in the room with drawn swords, about 20 of them, and all around us on the ship. And thanks to God, I had the strength and fleetness to take those aforementioned letters from London and destroy them. And I put the gold ducats, the um, um, money belt of gold ducats next to my flesh. On Monday, the 16th of Tammuz in the evening, the enemy came and took all the money bags, including a purse containing deposits that I had in my bosom, and they took all the merchandise and they demanded and searched all our clothes, and they also searched in my clothes and in my bosom and in the pockets of the clothes I was wearing, 
But God in his manifold mercies wrote that they did not find the money belt. They kept us in Siandalik in Turkey uh, for six days and they tried to provoke a quarrel with the captain in order to set an attack upon us. But the master of our vessel was a man of good sense and bore everything, keeping his mouth sealed. So that was another of his adventures. And <clears throat> and um, the, di the diary um, um, come to an end um, after uh, in 1757. He returns home, and uh, as I said. Uh, for five years, uh, 1964, uh, sorry, 1764, he was uh, the rabbi of Cairo. And, um, and then in 1772, I think, or three, when he's much older, uh, he goes um, for the second mission. The second mission, uh, I won't read, of course, the journey, the hard journey to get to leave and to get on a boat. And also, um, he doesn't go back to England, as I said, but he does go back to France. And I'll read a little bit about that. Okay, so um, among the people, the friends he made, there were people who again wanted to show him the sights of uh, Paris and take him to Versailles, to the court of Louis the Fifteenth. So that um, he talks about the seventh of Tevet in 1777. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Tuesday, no, uh, that day in the morning, Signor Fabri sent a fine carriage for us to go to Versailles, and we went together with Signor Ventura. He had sent a sword uh, for us, but I just put on my good clothes, and we went to Versailles by the Rue des Neiges, <coughs> Versailles Severin where Signor Fabri stopped at the house of a woman relative of his. They received us with cheerful countenance and gave us chocolate to drink. Then we went to the royal court. The Gentile went in first and I followed. We entered a chamber, this is of course the palace in Versailles. We entered a chamber, beautiful and splendid, with many columns, gilded all around, supporting huge lamps. The ceiling was ornamented and decorated with pictures, and there, high up, was a gallery where co uh, courtiers were standing. We passed through many more rooms, regal rooms, and eventually we entered the council chamber. There at the top was a gilded dais, ornamented and decorated with regal opulence, where the king sits in his royal throne with the ministers before him in the chamber. Then we went into inner chambers. We stood at the beginning of one chamber and after a while passed through some high-ranking ministers. And amongst them was the king's brother, Monsieur Comte de Provence, who is called just by the, the title Monsieur. And the younger brother, Monsieur le Comte d'Artois, they stood next to me for about five minutes, and then the king went through, and I recited the benediction over a king. He was wearing a simple red costume with a blue emblem with the royal arms. Shortly after, the king had passed by, 
a minister came up to Monsieur Fabry, who was at my side, saying that the king had asked of which country I was the ambassador. And he answered, he is not an ambassador, only a visitor from Egypt, who has come out of curiosity. After that we left, and all, all those around were showing great deference. Some of the dam who were passing by made reverencia according to their custom. We arrived in the house of Monsieur Fabry's relative, where they did me great honor. They gave me a gift of a porcelain finjan, which is a coffee cup, uh, <clears throat> and saucer, which Madame Comtesse d'Artois had given Monsieur Fabry's relative as a gift. Uh, on the finjan was inscribed the arms of King Louis. He also gave me some cases for putting papers inside, such as chronicles for safekeeping. These cases are of glass and look like cloth. He then asked me what I would like to eat, and I replied, eggs fried by my assistant. They set the table and we sat down. I ate a little bread and two fried eggs, and I recited the grace after meals. Then I prayed Mincha, and we took off in the carriage. And the countryside was covered in snow, so they couldn't really see very much of the gardens. And we arrived safely home. The Gentile insisted on paying for the carriage. This is wondrous, the favor which God gave me in his eyes. I give thanks and praise for all his kindnesses. May he be blessed. And it seems that um, he was also asked to bless some of the uh, nobility who were around there um, because they thought of him as a very holy person. And in conclusion, I want to read um, about uh, how he got the bad news of his... Uh, wife's death, and what he did. <clears throat> um, on the Holy Sabbath, a bundle of letters arrived for me from Livorno, all sealed. Sunday, I, after her, uh, Sunday, I mean, he mean, I think he means, um, Arab of Sunday, Motsay uh, Shabbat. Uh, after, no, maybe not, I don't know. Anyway, uh, after Habdallah, I went to my room and opened the letters. And I saw that for my many sins, a decree is pronounced on the woman, the wife of my youth. A kind-hearted, clear-headed, God-fearing woman, charitable, modest, the delight of my eyes, the beauty of my home, my mistress Rachel, her soul in Eden and the world grew dark around me. But it immediately came to my mind that if I disclosed this thing, they would willingly... Oh, he's in Tunis. And um, he has a very unfavorable um, uh, opinion of the women of Tunis. So you will understand what he's saying. If I disclosed this thing, they would willy-nilly force a wife upon me. And there is no saving from their hand. The fact being that they are so very, very attached to me, unimaginably so, and no argument will prevail against them. And literally, by a royal decree, would they force it upon me. And blessed is his glorious name, who wrought wondrous kindness with me in this moment of great distress, that this thought came into my mind. I then straight away took a lamp and I went to the synagogue and I wept there for an hour or so. Then I left there and I washed my face. In my room, I found Rabbi Moshe and Rabbi Judah, the two brothers-in-law of the Kaid, and a young man, Rabbi Moshe Ben Meir, who was staying with the Kaid, and also some other people. 
and I was there with them in distress till midnight. After they went, I sat on the ground to recite Tikkun Hatzot, and I took off my shoes and socks to do mourning as is requisite for late tidings. And for my many sins, she had departed this life on the 20th of Sivan. <coughs> and he hears about it in Adar. It's very late tidings. And for my many sins, she had, uh, the 20th of Sivan, Friday. May her soul be bound up in the bond of the living. And everything was done in quiet and in secret. Every night I used to do this, and I grew ill as a result of all this evil news. For three days I donated money for charity and oil for lighting for the resting of her soul. And I was oppressed, and I grieved over the loss of this pearl, who was probably unique in this generation in the estimation of my mind, in wisdom and honor and incredible, marvelous good sense, charm, beauty, and an exceeding modesty that cannot be imagined, and supreme cleanliness, to the extent that I became downcast and sullen. This was the cause of my falling sick with the black sickness, whatever that is, so that I was unable to talk, nor did I trust in telling any person about this matter. And I was in this distress for many days, even when I finally boarded the ship, when we departed from Tun Tunis, I did not trust in telling Abraham, my assistant, in case the ship became damaged and we had to return and he would let the matter be known until we reached Livorno and then I told Abraham. So that was uh, about his, his wife. And five years later, the Chida married a second Rachel, a native of Pisa who was about 25 years his junior. And he praises her also in the diary. Um, but there were no children from this marriage. Of his children from the first Rachel, one daughter was married and lived in Stadno near Livorno, where he spent the last, he spent the last years of his life in Livorno. And um, he was, uh, had quite, uh, he saw his married daughter quite often and ate with them sometimes. And uh, his uh, eldest son, whom he was very f fond of, visited him with a grandson. And this son followed in his footsteps as an emissary. So <clears throat> I hope from this evening I've been able to give you at least a partial glimpse of the Chida and his period as recorded in his diaries. Is it known when he did his writing Rachel, with all his troubles? When he did, um, when he wrote this Gabriel, many books? Gabriel, take the microphone. We'll go that far. Here, here. Take it. Don't pull it too much until you see how much. Right. What was the question? Somebody wants to ask a question. Take the microphone. Take them and all come up and use it. That's right. Question. My question was: Is it known? Yeah, use the microphone. Is it known when he did all his writing and his his, his copious uh, scholarship? I think he wrote as he went along. On the boats. That's a diary. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not memoirs. It's a diary. Yeah. Yeah. With each day written. And the question? You wanted to ask. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I wondered how did he communicate in England? What language did he have in common with the people what in language English? language did he communicate? <laughs> in English. Language. language. I, well, he knew six languages, so Not I presume well, he was able, he probably learned them on the job. <laughs> and uh, he, I have spoken, know, he wrote uh, the diaries in Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, but he probably spoke Ladino, Judeo Spanish. Um, English, I doubt. No. <laughs> 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 
questions, questions. I think some of the things I um, I read were quite private things he wrote in his diary, um, but it uh, gives you a picture of him not only as a scholar but of a <coughs> of an interesting uh, man who had a lot of uh, emotions and. Uh, and experience, <laughs> and um, he. Um, oh, do you want to ask something? No. Oh. Where was the diary kept all those years? Um, that's a good question. I don't know, but you may find something in Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I know that um, they were never um, translated uh, completely. Never. But there is a. <coughs> some of his writings anyway. Well, some of the, his writings, I'm sure, uh, survived, many of them. <coughs> and he's also a street. <laughs> uh, what were his religious writings? What was his religious life? Writing. 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 Um, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, Stephen, do you know? Well, he... His I, religious writings. He wrote copiously on many, many, many subjects. He has a lot. Also, <laughs> halakha. I only know, I also did research on, on bibliography, on books, because he knew all the sources. And so he put out a, a book of, of all the, a sort of dictionary, a lexicon of Shem Agdolim, important people in Jewish history, and also important books in Jewish history, and, and what's in them. <laughs> So it was enormously like learned. Like a catalogue. Yeah. <coughs> he gave a lot of uh, sermons. In fact, a lot of the sermons are in the back of this book, in different places where he happened to be. And they asked him to speak. So. Conclude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, would you prepare to say a few words in the, in the form of a vote of thanks? Wow. <laughs> uh, nothing elaborate. <laughs> 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 I was fascinated by this uh, story of the Chida and another side of him, because he is known as a, as I mentioned, as a scholar of enormous uh, erudition, and he wrote extensively on many subjects, halachic, historical, even geographical, and now we see another side of him, a personal side, and some of him of what he was doing. Now. Um, since I have known this reputed uh, speaker uh, since 1954, uh, um, when uh, she was a distinguished student at St. Hilda's in Oxford, um, it's a great pleasure for me to say thank you very much. It was enormously enjoyable. Thank you very much. Just a few uh, words uh, which are not necessarily connected with the lecture. Um, first of all, uh, we heard distressing news today that uh, we are in a much better position as far as lectures, organization, finance are concerned than the Mother Society in London, which is apparently in a dreadful mess. So I would say that, uh, thank God, we uh, are not beholden to anybody as far as that's concerned. Maybe it's part of what's going on in Britain in general. Uh, 
I wanted to mention the fact that um, some of you may have seen in yesterday's Jerusalem Post a four-column article by Greer Faye Cashman paying tribute to our late committee member, Rabbi Raymond Apple, Zikronoli uh, I had spoken to Greer about a week or so beforehand, pointing out that there'd be the Shoshim coming up and nothing had appeared, no obituaries or anything that we had seen in the Hebrew press, the English press, and maybe she would like to, since she was familiar with him from also from the Australian background, <coughs> and anyway, she did us proud. I, I, those of you who read it will, will have seen that it was a very detailed and a very appreciative uh, tribute. I wanted to mention another thing in that connection. Um, I received the other day uh, a copy of my uh, Oxford College magazine, called the, uh, the Oil Magazine, uh, which is always full of interesting information. Names of new students, the recent successes, and all the usual stuff. And it mentioned, among other things, that a certain gentleman, whose name I don't remember at the moment, but never, uh, you could easily find out, had recently been appointed um, um, His Majesty's Ambassador to Israel. And he was a more recent than me, well, a graduate of Oriel College. And that he had said previously served in some very uh, well known embassies <coughs> in the Middle East and was taking his job seriously and uh, endeavouring to learn Ivrit as fast as possible. I was most impressed to hear that. I don't know whether all the ambassadors do such a thing. Uh, anyhow, um, I think maybe we will try to establish contact with him. It might be very interesting because there are a number of uh, Oxford graduates among us and um, it would be interesting to see what happens if we try to make contact. Uh, apart from that, the last thing is, next month, we are going to have a lecture by a new lecturer. Where is he? Hiding in a blue chair. Ah, 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 yes, yes. Uh, his topic is going to be... Topic, your topic will be... topic is the contribution of Marx and Spencer ah. to the... To the uh, Saving of the Jews of Europe in the Second World War. That's right, yeah. This is something uh, new, it's very, uh, it should be a most interesting and unusual um, lecture by uh, Lawrence. Uh, we all know that Marx and Spencer actually placed their building, I think, in the West End at the disposal of, of uh, the Jewish Agency or something like that at one point, but that might have been later on. But the, uh, the idea that they were so involved in uh, Holocaust uh, rescue is uh, something new. I'm sure that all of us will be very interested to hear what uh, our uh, distinguished lecturer has to tell us. Right, normally a vote of thanks is given uh, by a member of the committee. However, we are suffering from a certain number of uh, casualties owing to the season. Uh, for example, our uh, secretary uh, was not able to be here, and um, uh, we also had uh, other problems of that kind. We also would be needing to replace Raymond, of course, on the committee. A lot of things need to be done, but meanwhile, we do have a program going up to April, I think. So you will be kept informed, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again and again. By the way, what's the date of the next meeting? 20th of March. March. It was not available when I saw it in print. Um, what was I going to say? The uh, about uh, forthcoming events. Ah, uh, 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 yes, yes. We, um, as you know, or those of you may know, we have two publications of our own. There was the book that came out about ten years ago, which was a collection of essays on a variety of subjects. Uh, to do with the Jewish uh, emigrant from Britain to various parts of the world. 
Uh, and now, more recently, we brought out a new volume uh, which is uh, specifically uh, devoted to one topic. Uh, sorry, it was devoted to several topics um, and it should have been available for sale. Normally it goes through about uh, 40, 50 shekels. Unfortunately, copies were not available today, but next time I'll make sure that they are, because it's a very interesting, well-illustrated volume, and for about 50 shekels or so, it's very, very good value these days. <laughs> Every time I go into the Mac College, I can't believe the prices have gone up so much. So this will be a, uh, in a different category. But meanwhile, if, uh, unless anybody has got any questions they want to ask me, uh, I will say thank you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.